what I was thinking with my question was kind of the start of Plato's Republic, Plato basically asking, does might always make right? And then Socrates is setting out to say no, truth and like persuasion can come into play and alter the course of events if if enough people are persuaded. And it doesn't necessarily need to resort to force. Um, although force and strength of an argument may be an effect of having right reason, I think philosophers can play an important role in trying to influence others by the force of their reason to oppose something that is that they they see as being wrong. And so I, I don't know if it's prudent or responsible to to stand outside of an issue that could come to bear on the dignity of the human person or something important like that. Yeah, this this seems to be, you know, an increasingly timely, if, if no less fraught, issue. The question of political critique and the question going back certainly to books one and two of Republic of the relation between force and reason, between force and dialogue or dialectic. One way of reading Plato is that Plato transforms this Greek agonistic struggle, spirit, into the realm of the mind. That what was before a sort of struggle between warriors, between Achilles and Hector, now becomes a struggle in language, in words, in discourse, between, between Socrates and Thrasymachus, between Socrates and Glaucon, between fellow editors. The difference here is that the goal is not to overwhelm your opponent, to slay him, and then to vaunt over his corpse, as you see throughout the Iliad, the difference here with Socrates is this kind of philosophical Achilles, is that the victory in discourse is a victory for truth. It's a victory for both sides, for the, the, the one who has the truth and for the one who comes to have the truth. So it looks like, um, so to take Plato at face value, this is the replacement of a Zero, maybe say a zero sum game, one lives, one dies, political in, in sort of military struggle with a positive sum game, where engaging in dialogue with Socrates is okay, still sort of putting an asterisk by Socrates' irony, asking for what purpose that's there. Uh, engaging in this discourse with Socrates leads us both to truth, and we both improve and draw closer to the reality of things, we both get outside the cave. That's one story. Another story is that this it represents a kind of slave morality, to use Nietzsche's term. Socrates is the very first one of those figures to ironically subvert strength and will to power and to replace it with something kind of down market and cheap. That this is actually a fall away from human excellence. And I don't have to sort of go back to the sort of Achilles as the kind of manly warrior who slays his foes and, and celebrates his victory by praising himself to see that maybe there's a, a question here about the intellectual independence from the political that maybe comes up along the same pattern. Is the retreat, and yeah, sorry, retreat is the wrong word for it, is the shift into discourse and conversation itself necessarily an advance? I think I've already mentioned I'm a kind of non-ironical reader of Plato. I am still, I suppose, enough of a liberal to be committed to the idea that we talk so we don't fight, and that the choice of reason over the disposition of force is itself uh, not just a good choice, but an obviously good choice. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's the question, you know, where, where do you end up standing? One way of saying this is to, to go here and to say, let's be neutral about the force question is to favor the stronger side, whoever that happens to be. And you can say, well, it wouldn't matter to me. TSL, I'd say, would say, I'd take the same stand even if the Republicans were about to overwhelm the Frankists. I, I, I don't care. That's my, my point is I don't care um, about that. Or this is sort of Nietzsche's attack on Socrates. This is a matter not of being neutral, but of ironically subverting both sides. Right, Achilles and Hector lose. All of that entire system of things loses, and this is this is uh, on Nietzsche's reading. 
Socrates kind of sets Western civilization on the course to nihilism because he has sort of placed himself as the model of human excellence over these great warrior figures and these kings and these political figures, but he has to do it with this kind of insidious, you know, acid of irony that eats away at everything. So nobody, nobody can be, nobody can be good enough. Nobody can be better than him. He pulls things down to his level. Now that's a sort of cynical reading of the Socratic project. Like I said, I, I, I think, I think, you know, as, as Bruce Wayne believes in Harvey Dent, I believe in Socrates still. I, I don't think he is this sort of troll figure who brings down the human spirit. Um, I do think he's this uh, intellectual inspiration. You know, I teach, try to teach the way that I try to teach. 